And the State of the Union conference goes on and after the session on EU soft power in neighboring regions, we are moving to our next one, this time on EU sanctions and what's their place in the world. This is the second panel on peace and human rights in this 2021 edition of the State of the Union conference at the European University Institute. On stage is the moderator for this session, Neha Jain, Professor of Public International Law and Co-Director, Academy of European Law at the European University Institute. Welcome to this panel on peace and human rights at the 2021 edition of the Strait of the Union. My name is Neha Jain, and I'm delighted to moderate this panel entitled EU Sanctions, What is Their Place in the World Today? In December last year, the EU adopted a new instrument in its toolkit to promote human rights, its own global human rights sanctions regime. The sanctions instrument comes on top of other restrictive measures that the EU has been adopting for much longer. Some of these merely implement UN sanctions, but the EU also adopted so-called autonomous sanctions regimes, acting on its own motion to further its own common security foreign policy. What lessons can be learned from the experience of these sanctions and those of other sanctions regimes? Who feels threatened and who feels the pain? Are these sanctions smart enough? And what are the costs and benefits of these sanctions, for example, in areas such as peace negotiations or humanitarian aid? To help us answer these questions, we have with us today an extremely rich panel with the ultimate insider perspective on the implementation of EU sanctions and other sanctions regimes who deal with this on a daily basis. With me today, we have Betty Begombe, former senior director of the Fragility, Conflict, and Violence Department in the World Bank Group, who had extensive experience in peace negotiations, including with prescribed groups such as the Lord's Resistance Army, and more recently, in South Sudan. We have Emanuela Chiara Gillard, who's an associate fellow at the International Law Program at Chatham House, and a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. And finally, we have Commissioner Mairead McGuinness, Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability, and Capital Markets Union in the European Commission. And in that capacity, responsible for the implementation of the EU's restrictive measures. And last, but absolutely not least, we have all of you fortunately joining us via the digital platform. Please open the live discussion tab at the lower right-hand corner of your screen, where you can submit questions in the live Q&A. And if all that is not enough, you can tweet about the session using the hashtag, hashtag SOU2021. Back to the substance, back to our panelists. Perhaps I could begin with your thoughts on the context in which EU sanctions operate. At present, there are about 14 UN sanctions regimes in the world, in addition to implementing these for the member states, the EU itself has introduced about 35 sanctions regimes. But the question is how significant a player is the EU itself in the world of sanctions? Does it set the standard or does it merely follow the standard that's set by others, such as the United Nations or the United States? In other words, what is the added value of EU sanctions and autonomous EU sanctions? Is there a Brussels effect? Commissioner McGuinness, um, this is very much your bailiwick, um, so perhaps we could start with you. What would you say is the added value of um, autonomous EU sanctions? I do apologize, colleagues. I've done too many Zoom meetings today and my microphone was closed. So I thank you for your patience. I was making the point uh, that our sanctions are part of uh, a multilateral effort. So they work best when they're implemented by the international community. Um, and that's why the European Union you know, fully implements uh, sanctions imposed by the UN. 
But we also, as you have rightly pointed out, are ready to impose autonomous sanctions. And really, we do that in pursuit of our own common policy and uh, common foreign rather and security um, objectives. Um, do our sanctions matter? I think they do. Um, we're the world's largest single market with 27 member states, 440 million inhabitants. Uh, and I think our sanctions do have an impact. But of course, sanctions happen really at, as a last resort. Uh, we would rather that uh, you know, dialogue, uh, diplomacy would avoid sanctions. But where it's unavoidable and we have concerns, then we do act. So yes, I think to, to your question, do they matter? Is there an effect? Yes, absolutely, there is. Uh, and the, 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 I suppose for us, uh, we need to try and maximize the impact of the sanctions that we impose. Um, that involves us coordinating across our member states around implementation. Um, and I think that where we have proper implementation, there is an effect, uh, as you've asked rightly in, in, the, in the question. I think in addition, many countries would also align themselves with sanctions that the European Union puts in place. So, for example, our EU candidate countries or indeed potential candidates uh, countries in the EFTA, the EFTA, the, the European Free Trade Association, and indeed some other in the Eastern Partnership would mirror what the European Union does. And we have regular engagements with all of those countries on sanctions. And I suppose uh, another point to make is that we would offer technical assistance to other countries um, on both EU and UN sanctions. And I think there is an interest from countries outside of the European Union in our experience and indeed our expertise when it comes to the use of sanctions. However, there is one area which does cause difficulties and certainly we, we're, we're not in, in the business of, so we do not um, apply sanctions extra territoriality. So we, we restrict it to what is within our remit and we act in full compliance with both international law and European Union law. Uh, and what we try to do is seek to extend the reach of our sanctions through cooperation, and coordination with other partners. And that might be a point uh, worth picking up with, with our other panelists. Um, uh, sanctions, again, are one of the most important tools we have uh, to promote our values. So peace, uh, human rights, security uh, at the global level. And you know the total number of sanctions in place at the moment at 40 is high. Um, and we are, the European Union, one of the key actors on sanctions globally increasingly using sanctions as a mechanism to prevent conflict, to stop the proliferation of weapons, to combat human rights violations, and to respond to crises. Um, so also we would use sanctions to deal with global threats, terrorism, cyber and chemical attacks, and more recently human rights violations. The, this uh, latest sanctions regime is a sign of our determination to protect and promote human rights around the world. And I think our citizens expect that. Uh, and it's something that Europe has done and will continue to do. Um, the first package of listings uh, adopted in March had a global reach. And the unacceptable reaction and retaliation that it triggered in some countries um, show that EU sanctions are not taken lightly. So very often when we impose sanctions, there is sometimes quite a dramatic uh, impact. So in summary, what we do matters. It matters to us because we want to promote our values and to support uh, human rights globally. And I think the response we get from our sanctions that are imposed show that they do, if you like, hit home and have an impact. Thank you. And so, so that sounds like a very ambitious agenda and also a very forward-looking agenda. And as you emphasized, the Commissioner, it matters not just for the people on the ground or the people on whom this has an impact, but also for the EU itself. Um, would you be on board with that, Mr. Lord? You too have worked quite a lot on, on sanctions and, and seen the impact of EU sanctions, especially in, in the areas that you work on, which is humanitarian aid. Um, would you agree with the Commissioner? Um, in terms of the intended impact, how significant a player is the EU in terms of leading to a modification of behavior? In order to determine that, we've really got to focus on the context where the EU has adopted autonomous measures as opposed to merely giving effect to um, sanctions imposed by the UN. I think it's always very difficult to tell generally whether sanctions have actually modified uh, the behavior. 
I think it's particularly challenging because in the context where the EU has adopted autonomous measures are frequently also the same ones where the US has adopted autonomous measures. And, and the US sanctions are really quite um, a heavyweight in terms of breadth, and in some contexts, US sanctions are akin to comprehensive sanctions, but also in terms of reach. The points of contact um, that bring into play US sanctions are extremely broad. So for example, US financial sanctions come into play the moment um, uh, transactions go through, financial transactions are conducted in, in dollars and they become applicable. This makes it quite difficult, I think, to determine the impact in terms of modification of behavior, but also good practices um, that, that are adopted by the EU. They tend to be a bit drown, drowned out by the, the practice of US sanctions in particular contexts. Um, in terms of added value over and above um, UN sanctions, I think they are significant in terms of achieving policy objectives because they tend to be imposed in contexts where we have a stalemate in the Security Council, Syria, Ukraine, Myanmar. This, these are the moments where the EU can adopt its own autonomous um, sanctions to modify uh, behaviors. You asked earlier about the, the Brussels effect. And um, as an observer, I would say this is probably something that you see more internally, and also as an opportunity for setting good practices for the other actors that are adopting similar measures. What do I mean by the internal Brussels effect? Well, I think EU sanctions are far more democratic. If you compare them to the Security Council, uh, 15 member states impose the sanctions, which 193 member states are then obliged to implement and enforce with no opportunity to actually shape these sanctions. The situation in Brussels is very different. You have 27 member states that impose the sanctions, and the same 27 that must actually implement and enforce them. And this is actually extremely important because it means everyone has an opportunity to feed into the process for deciding whether to impose sanctions, for elaborating the actual restrictions, and as far as my area of work, the impact of sanctions on humanitarian action is concerned, the same 27 member states also have an opportunity to include safeguards to ensure that there isn't a negative impact on humanitarian action or a more general negative impact, and also to look at ways of improving this. So this is really an important Brussels dimension. Another Brussels effect is that EU sanctions are far more law-abiding. There's far greater judicial involvement, in particular in terms of reviewing of the listings of, of groups, of individuals. This is something that we see very much in relation to the EU sanctions. Uh, personally, I would be very interested to see whether there would be any judicial interpretation of how EU sanctions actually comply with international humanitarian law, whether they actually do permit, um, in particular, humanitarian action to be conducted as foreseen by international humanitarian law. That's something that hasn't happened yet, but I think would be interested. And finally, to me, and very importantly, the Brussels effect in terms of the development of good practices that can be used as models elsewhere at UN level, but also domestically. And what do I mean by good practices? Good practices in terms of dialogue um, with all relevant stakeholders when the sanctions are adopted and uh, throughout their implementations. Um, good practices in terms of the communications that the Commission has issued clarifying how EU measures actually work. This is extremely important for the variety of actors that must comply with them. And also good practices in terms of, again, in ter uh, as far as my area of work is concerned, safeguards to ensure that despite 
the sanctions, humanitarian action can continue. And I think here we really have an opportunity for the EU to show what is possible. So, so that's, um, that's interesting, um, the emphasis on, on the EU and the uniqueness that EU sanctions can bring. Um, Ms. Begombe, you've had, you've had experience on the ground looking not just at sanctions from the EU perspective, but also the UN and the US, and what concrete impact they have on the ground. Um, what would you say is, is the added value of EU sanctions in particular, um, given your experience? Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to our distinguished uh, participants. I am actually in South Sudan, Juba, um, where, which has given me opportunity to interact with some senior government officials who have been sanctioned, but mainly by uh, the US. Uh, my interaction was to find out what impact the sanctions have had on them and whether it works or maybe, it, uh, and if not, and uh, what approach could be improved on some of these sanctions. Uh, first of all, EU sanction has more impact than probably the, the, the US. The reason is that for centuries, I'm talking in the context of Africa, Africa has interacted with Europe much longer than with the US. Um, there's a history with colonialism, education, everything. Uh, I mean, mainly it's all from uh, Europe. And therefore, whether individuals or countries that are sanctioned, it has that impact that maybe bank accounts are closed. Maybe uh, they cannot travel. Maybe their children cannot go into Europe. So from that perspective, uh, uh, EU sanction has a huge impact. But you also have a situation, let me give Zimbabwe as an example. It had an impact in the sense that when the late President Mugabe became very dictatorial and the sanction was slapped by EU on Mugabe, the economy collapsed at the same time. And that acted as a catalyst to get Mugabe to, uh, to soften his stance on democracy and also abuse of human rights. But at the same time, while, uh, but at the same time, he kept on condemning it as an imperialism thing. It came, it kept, he kept on um, saying it was nothing. And at one point, as the, the, the economy collapsed and there was a lot of hardships on the, on the, on, on, in the country where the, uh, the, uh, the currency uh, became very weak, uh, uh, basically uh, the basic uh, services were not available. The people started blaming EU for their hardships. So the question now is, how do you balance that? That the uh, the uh, the sanction is actually meant uh, for the betterment of the people, so that they could practice democracy, so that human rights abuse um, was addressed. So there's that angle that you need to, uh, we need to understand how best can sanctions be administered in a manner that it does not affect the common man on the street. And consequently, they start decide, I mean, taking side uh, with, with their uh, leaders. Um, furthermore, we look at individuals' sanctions. But like I said, I'm here in Juba, and uh, very many senior government officials have been sanctioned. Has it caused any behavioral change? Has it affected their lifestyle? Uh, yes, somewhat. But uh, going to your question on whether uh, it should be autonomous is better than uh, joining hands, in my experience and from what I've seen, is that, yes, it has an impact. 
but it would be very important to have that harmony between the countries, between the, the UN, uh, the EU. Uh, of course, I cannot talk about regional organizations because they would fight it. Uh, but I also found out that the government, I mean, tries to protect the individuals that have been sanctioned. So these are uh, issues that uh, call for more debates so that sanctions can have better impact than at the moment it is having. Have I run out of time or should I continue? Uh, the other thing, yeah, I talked about uh, whether it's, it brings in the behavioral change or uh, is the e, does the EU have any mechanism of evaluating the impact uh, of, of these sanctions, whether it's on individuals, like I said, I've interacted with some senior government officials in, in here, they bring out uh, different issues. We were not given opportunity to uh, defend ourselves. No letters were written to us. We just found out it came out in the news. Uh, what if the people who gave information to EU or UN or to the US were just individuals who were against us for some reason or the other? So these are things that need to be discussed. How best? Because there are challenges in here too, because they also feel their rights have been taken away from them by these sanctions. Right. Um, of course, it, it acts as a deterrent. Uh, but since um, sanctions started, has it been a deterrent really so that other uh, other governments, and I'm, I'm, I, I know Africa better than any other place, so I'm talking in the context of Africa, have it, if it's, it's, it's a deterrent, have other governments that have come in, look at it that, I don't want my country, or I don't want me as individual to fall in the same trap as the other people. So it's, whether it's, it's a deterrent that works, or, or which works, or doesn't work as a deterrent, we also need to get the narrative uh, out uh, so that there could be more debates on uh, the impact of uh, the sanctions. I think I'll stop there at the moment. Thank you, and that's, that's a very helpful reminder that you know, a sanction is only as good as its implementation, uh, and much will depend on the implementation. So that actually feeds very well into, into the second question that I had um, for the panelists, for all of you, uh, which is um, what are the strengths and, and the weaknesses of the, UN, of the EU sanctions regime and of autonomous sanctions? So the EU was not the first player. Um, it, was, it was perhaps this crappy sibling who came after in terms of designing its own autonomous sanctions. But the EU had the benefit of other sanctions regimes that have gone before it, um, in particular the United States and the United Nations. Um, so given that context in which um, the EU is, is the ambitious, crappy, um, intelligent uh, sibling, the younger sibling on sanctions, what are the main strengths and the weaknesses of these autonomous sanctions? Um, if you could, I, I know this is a very, a very broad question in some ways. So if you could just give me one strength and one weakness each of autonomous EU sanctions. Uh, and perhaps we would start with you, Ms. Pagamba, this time, um, as somebody who also ex has vast experience in the other sanctions. Are you starting with me? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier, is that this, it's very important that uh, this harmony, I mean, uh, EU and the US and UN, they come out with uh, the sanctions at the same time, because you see, uh, if somebody is sanctioned by you by by, by EU, uh, there's still a loophole that they take advantage of the US not being part of it. In the same vein, if okay, UN is slightly different because everybody is um, all the countries, all these countries are members uh, of the UN, so it's slightly different. But to me, I see it as it would have 
better impact, more impact. Uh, let me give example of uh, uh, the people here that I have met um, that, that have been sanctioned. Uh, they can still bank their money in Europe because the sanction was US. They can still travel to some parts of Europe because this was a US uh, sanction. They can still send their children. They still have the leverage of carrying out their normal duties. It says, who wants to go to the US anyway? Uh, we can always go to Europe and deal with Europe. So once it's lopsided, I dare say, and forgive me here, that I have not really sat down to analyze that what whether it serves the purpose effectively or it does not. Uh, because if I can't do it in the US, if it's on the US, I can still deal with Europe, uh, with European countries. So, and that, uh, so I think it's very, very important. And I still, uh, I won't talk about, the, well, the negative side is having autonomous uh, it doesn't really have that impact that we are looking for. Uh, many countries uh, would still get away if, if the sanction is on a country or a government, uh, or if the sanction is on individuals. Once it's on the done by US, it still this it gives room to maneuver and work with Europe or EU countries, if you will. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner McGuinness, if, um, if then the ball falls in the EU's court, if, uh, if people can still do business with Europe, uh, what would you say are, are one of the main strengths and the main weaknesses of the autonomous sanctions? Well, let me just uh, say that Betty's experience is well worth listening to because she's on the ground and she's given us very interesting uh, food for thought. I mean, very clearly, the more coordinated we are globally on sanctions, the better the effect. So if uh, the US has sanctions and Europe isn't at the same time, you will obviously have this effect that has just been described. Equally, if the EU has sanctions and the US is not involved, you equally have that capacity for those who will try and overcome the sanction impact to have a positive uh, result. Um, so we're not actually achieving the benefits of coordination. Maybe to repeat the point that, um, you know, sanctions are not just um, done overnight. They, they result from real concerns about what's happening, whether it's around human rights abuses or um, all sorts of things that are really should be dealt with in, uh, uh, you know, through diplomacy, through political engagement. But when all else fails, you need sanctions. So to your question then around strengths uh, and then challenges. Um, I think the uh, the strengths are that our sanctions, and it was mentioned earlier, um, they're done by the entire you know um, grouping of council of ministers. Uh, sometimes we think it should be by qualified majority voting rather than by everyone agreeing. But because there is such a, a democratic um, vote in relation to our sanctions, they're part of a wider framework, if you like. So they're not just in isolation from our concerns around our policy, both security and foreign policy objectives. Um, and therefore, there's a lot of discussion and debate uh, around both our policy objectives and why sanctions are necessary. They're also, um, and I think this is an important point as well, they're imposed with full respect of uh, due process and EU law. Um, so that individuals and entities that find themselves subject to European sanctions know why they're being targeted. They can, and this has already been mentioned, challenge that listing before the European courts. Um, so we are very, very open to that challenge, uh, but equally um, we impose sanctions because we believe uh, that we will not be found wanting in terms of compliance with our own legislation. Then in terms of the challenges, and I think Betty has really outlined some of those challenges. So how do we measure the effectiveness of our sanctions? Um, and I suppose we should measure against our objectives. So do our sanctions at EU level limit access to funding that uh, regimes, oppressive regimes, for example, um, does, does it actually work from that point of view? Have they um, stopped at all this proliferation of weapons of mass destruction? And maybe the question is, 
what would the situation be like if we hadn't imposed sanctions? And it was actually something I wrote down while I was listening there, that to some extent, there will be always an imperfection around sanctions. But equally, if we do nothing, there's a huge void that needs to be filled that diplomacy isn't filling. And therefore, the sanctions are imposed with that very much in mind, um, that we want to bring about change. We are making a very strong statement. So, you know, achieving goals, not so easy when you have sanctions, but I think the statement is very strong. Um, For us, uh, implementation, effective implementation across all of our member states is really key. Uh, And that's something uh, that comes under my remit. So in January, we adopted a communication which had several proposals around sanctions and a number of goals were outlined in that. So this idea of targeted smart sanctions uh, being effective, but a minimal disruption to the global market. I mean, this is the broad uh, frame in which we work. Second is that we want information on how sanctions are implemented to flow seamlessly between European Union and our member states. So we need a lot of coordination around implementation. And then as a commission, we want to support our member states so that they do apply all these sanctions in a uniform way and help business operators to navigate what can be very difficult territory uh, around uh, their obligations and what is prohibited under EU law. So I'll give you an example. The adoption of the EU global human rights sanctions regime, uh, that was accompanied by a guidance note to, uh, if you like, ensure that we had uniform implementation from the very outset. And it was the first time we did this. I think it shows that the effective implementation of EU sanctions is a priority for us. It's something that we will continue to do. Um, And I think this uniform implementation, effective implementation, is also part of the European Union's credibility you know, as a, if you like, a regulatory power, uh, and also it maintains the integrity of our own single market. So the work we're doing around ensuring effective implementation, um, first of all, we want to see it happen because that's why we have sanctions in place. Secondly, the member states also want to make sure that what they're doing is complying with the sanctions regime we have in place and that they're not found wanting. Uh, And I suppose the third issue is that when we do impose sanctions, we are making a very strong political statement. Um, And I think to address a point uh, that Betty rightly raises, we have to be very careful that we target effectively so that there isn't a spillover effect, an unintended consequence uh, for people who may be vulnerable and who should not be uh, impacted by sanctions. And this may be an issue that we will perhaps speak to uh, at some point. But certainly, I think from from my uh, side here, I think the strength is that they are taken, uh, these decisions are taken not lightly, but taken in a very firm way, and that we also uh, manage the implementation. Uh, And indeed, we've stepped up our work in that regard, because in the past, we have known where there were difficulties and our member states need adequate guidance. Thank you. Thank you. And so so I'm hearing a couple of themes emerge from from your two responses, the importance of coordination with with other agencies, the importance of being, being very careful about the implementation and how focused that implementation would be. But also equally importantly, um, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, which is to say that there will always be some areas um, which which sanctions could not possibly address. Um, And so so being, again, very careful about running a counterfactual um, as to what would have been the case had the sanctions not been in place. Um, Would you agree with some of those points, Ms. Ms. Gillard, in, in, in your assessment of the strengths and weaknesses? In terms of of strength, I I agree with the the points made by the previous speakers, and in particular, very much the the targeted nature of the sanctions. Um, As I said, I have been observing similar processes at New York level within the UN and in Brussels level, and I I look to what's happening in Brussels as a model for, for elsewhere. And what strikes me is that there is a far more serene engagement and cooperation between the various stakeholders, so the different parts, EU member states, the commission who are involved in the imposition and the implementations of sanctions, but also with key external stakeholders in very much identifying what the potential pitfalls are and finding solutions. So the commissioner mentioned understanding 
the unintended impact. Even targeted sanctions can have unintended impacts. And one of the strengths of the Commission is that in recent years, it has really taken steps to engage with the stakeholders who are suffering from these unintended impacts. And this I see as a strength, as an opportunity. And I see Brussels as really being at the forefront of finding ways both of clarifying this complex um, area of law and also setting examples. I think what would be welcomed from the outside, we've heard about the need for greater cooperation between uh, the Commission and, and various member states when it comes to implementation. I, as an outsider, I would really welcome greater transparency. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but I think it would be very useful if it, the outside world could also hear more about how individual member states have actually implemented sanctions, how they have issued licenses and derogations, because it is really valuable to the other actors who are doing the same with their own sanctions. So externally, what is a challenge? Um, again, looking outside, does the UN, does the US, are they, do they care? And I would say, are they even aware of what the EU does? And it's quite surprising. Um, frequently, there are, there are EU member states that are frequently on the Security Council, but because of the silos within government, we cannot assume that a, that a European member state that is on the Security Council even knows what the EU has done in terms of sanctions in Brussels and can then say, look, here's a good practice, let's try, let's try it out here in New York. That's as far as the UN is concerned. Uh, I think these challenges of, of lack of awareness are even starker when it comes to the US. Is the US aware? Does the US even care of, <laughs> as to the good practices that may have um, been uh, adopted at EU level? And it, it could be that there is a very good behind the scene dialogue between the European Commission and OFAC, so the part of the US Treasury that implements financial sanctions. It could be that it's there. It's not immediately apparent, including when one, as a researcher, speaks to these different bodies that are implementing um, sanctions. Um, my experience is if different parts of government were siloed, I would say that when it comes to the parts of the US that are adopting um, sanctions, they're blinkered. Um, I think that when we're looking at, at the US, and I keep on referring to the US because they are the, the heavy hitter, when they adopt sanctions, those are the ones that really shape the, the pain. And I think a, an additional challenge if we're trying to, to share good practices developed in Brussels with, with the US is that sanctions are an extremely political um, instrument when it comes to the US. Um, Congress is is very involved in, in their adoption with all the agendas that that entails. So while I think that there's a huge opportunity for the EU to, to really bring up good models, the challenge is, will others be aware of them? Absolutely, and, um, and again, an important reminder that, um, that those of us on the other side don't necessarily know how the sausage is made, of course, um, in terms of how, how the sanctions get designed and what, what different agendas get, um, get thrown into the design of those sanctions. Um, so now, um, very quickly perhaps, um, since, uh, since we do want to take some questions from the audience as well, um, the last question, since all, all three of you actually have emphasized this, is the design, the actual design of the sanctions. Um, have those imposing the sanctions actually managed to design sanctions in such a way that they target the people and the individuals and the activities that are supposed to be targeted uh, while minimizing any sorts of collateral consequences of those sanctions. Um, are the sanctions, in other words, sufficiently flexible? Are they sufficiently nimble uh, to be doing the sorts of work that we want them to be doing? Um, Ms. Gillard, you, you've spoken quite a bit, actually, on, on, on this, on the targeting part. Um, do you think that the EU sanctions are, are sufficiently nimble, in fact? So my work has focused on the unintended impact of sanctions on humanitarian action. And this most frequently, but not exclusively, arises in relation to financial sanctions, and in particular, when they are imposed 
on groups that control territory where there are people in need of assistance or key providers of uh, services in contexts where humanitarian action needs to be conducted. So for example, key telecommunications providers in a context where as part of COVID response, you need to allow, you need to ensure that um, children who are out at school can rely on um, internet providers and these are sanctioned. Or situations, again, I mentioned Syria, where key commodities for humanitarian response, such as uh, petroleum, for example, um, are subject to restrictions in, in trade, pursuant to trade sanctions. And I think that while EU sanctions are extremely targeted initially as imposed, their cascading or knock-on effects um, can be indiscriminate. And in fact, they can impact the most vulnerable sectors of the populations, those who are in need of humanitarian assistance. So I think that the EU has gone the first step in imposing very targeted measures, and now it has realized that that's not enough in and of itself, that it needs to refine the sanctions further to ensure that they do not impede humanitarian action. And I always say this is really not something that is insurmountable. Um, but what we need to do is to, to show this flexibility, this nimbleness in including appropriate safeguards to preserve the capacity for humanitarian action to be conducted. And this is where we need to be um, quite um, granular in our analysis in terms of understanding what is necessary. And it depends context by context, restriction by restriction, what is problematic and what is the appropriate solution. And what is essential is a dialogue. It's what I've been saying throughout, a dialogue between the key stakeholders, the member states that are imposing the sanctions, the commission in its in its important role in providing guidance and those who are affected by it. And this is something that we are seeing beginning to happen in Brussels. This dialogue is necessary to identify the problems on the side of humanitarian actors, to understand the, the concerns that states may have in granting appropriate safeguards and to craft the safeguards that strike the right balance between the two. And I don't think we have time to go into it now, but I think this is exactly what the EU did in relation to the restrictions on the purchase of petroleum products in Syria. Over the course of the years, it tailored them so that they could allow humanitarian action, but also address the concerns of the states in terms of abuse, but also that any exemptions would not undermine the policy objectives. I think that what's important is establishing a procedural a framework for such dialogue to occur in a systematic manner in relation to each security uh, sanctions regime at key moments of this before they're implemented and throughout their um, existence um, and in a, in a transparent manner. And that by that, I mean that all member states need to have the opportunity to participate in this. Um, and nimbleness in the review. If we see there is a problem, it, it can be fixed. Thank you. I could see, um, Ms. Begombe, I could see you nodding all the way away from Juba um, on the screen. Uh, would you say that some of this experience is reflected um, in, in your experience on the ground as well when it comes to peace negotiations? I think you might be still, uh, still muted, actually. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, it, um, the previous speaker said almost what I would have wanted to say. But let me start by saying that uh, the forms of sanctions vary in context. I mean, if it's an um, embargo, human rights issues. So they're designed specifically for a particular uh, crime, if I may say that. Uh, but that said, I also think uh, 
it's the design sometimes um, for, I'm looking for, for the right word to use and that uh, it's it's kind of almost cut and paste. Uh, Iran has done this, therefore it, it can be applied to another country. Uh, well, they're country specific, but also uh, sometimes um, it's not thorough enough to address the actual issues. Uh, so, but that said, I also want to emphasize that sanctions are very important and the European ones, especially in Africa, because there's been more interaction for centuries uh, between Europe and Africa. So the European in, in, in sanctions actually have a stronger impact uh, than what I would say even the UN ones, because UN is very general. Um, and like I said, it, it helps in, I mean, but I question whether all of them have that deterrent effect on, on, on the other countries that probably are going the same route. And, uh, and but I also think that sanctions need to be reviewed from time to time. Because for example, in conflict situations, the landscape is changing all the time. If it is an, a, a, uh, uh, an arms embargo, the borders are porous. Country B is cooperating with, with country A, which has been sanctioned. How can you uh, ensure that, that uh, country B does not help or support uh, country A with Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm saying this because there are cases where arms embargo is slapped on, uh, on a country, but a neighboring country, it doesn't even have to be a neighboring country, but another country is cooperating and still uh, the weapons are, sm are smuggled. So uh, in, um, uh, slapping sanctions on countries. We also need to understand how, in, in, what uh, the other measures that can make it uh, effective that need to come together with the sanctions so that if it is an, uh, a human, I mean, human rights uh, sanction on a government, for example, okay. Uh, what measures are there that uh, the country will say, we didn't do it, it's, uh, but the status quo continues. Could the, uh, the EU go back on the drawing table? It's working, but it's not having the impact, exact impact that we've had. Maybe design it differently and come back and reinforce what is the sanction that has already been issued so that it has that impact that uh, we are all looking for. Uh, the other thing is, I'm now thinking about Sudan, not South Sudan where I am, but uh, the pace at which if the country, uh, if things improve, for example, human rights issues, uh, the, the other government was overthrown in Sudan, but the lifting of the sanction is extremely slow. I do understand that it cannot be done overnight. Some of the individuals uh, that might continue with the new regime probably participated in the old regime. So it should be studied uh, carefully, but the pace is usually uh, extremely slow, uh, which is, as we all talked about earlier on, the spillover effect on innocent citizens. Uh, they don't feel uh, very, they don't feel that changes now come. We can now, the sanction can be lifted and we can conduct all, uh, our other activities. So that, that I thought also needs uh, to be looked at. And even on individuals, uh, the people I interacted here with, they said, okay, we were not given a chance to talk, to give our side of the story. Uh, they're challenging the decision. But on the other hand is asking, what do I need to do now 
so that the sanction is lifted on me. Uh, there's silence on that. So all this, uh, I'm bringing up issues that I think probably could make uh, sanctions have the desired impact we're looking for. Thank you, Ms. Begombe. I'm sorry, Commissioner, we don't have time to, to also go to you. Um, such a rich discussion. Um, but thank you, all of you, uh, very much for joining us for a very rich and stimulating discussion. And thank you to our audience um, for watching. And stay tuned for the next panel.